Is it on now? Yeah. There we go. Maybe it was on the whole time I was singing. That would be terrible. <laughs> that would not be good. If it is, can we just... We can't take that back. It's done. It's done. How's everybody doing this morning? Good. Iron Man Sunday. I would have... Well, Challenge Sunday. I would have been running Challenge this year, but it fell on a Sunday, so I couldn't do it. That's why I'm not running today, so... But I really wanted to, and, uh, but it's, every call has a cost, and for me, being a pastor is uh, one of the greatest costs, is I'll never be able to run a triathlon, and so it's too bad, because I really want to, and I think I could do really well, but uh, it's just not going to happen. But today, today I'm going to be preaching a message called, Called to the Kingdom Life. It's on, it's, um... It's interesting, when we think about calling, we often, we think about calling in terms of a vocation. We think of, we, th- we often think about calling to one of the five-fold ministries, pastor, teacher, apostle, prophet. We have, um, sometimes we, we find ourselves thinking in an Old Testament terms of calling. In the Old Testament, God may give them a project, build a building, build a temple, and then God would anoint people for specific tasks. God would anoint them to, to be an artisan or a sculptor or a mason, and he would, he would anoint them for a task. And sometimes we think of our callings in terms of, we kind of put it in a silo, and we just say, this is my calling, I'm called to do this. But under the new covenant, we're not called to a task, although those things, all those things, those do, those things do um, exist. We do have pastors, preachers, and teachers, evangelists. We do have the fivefold, but... Remember when Jesus died on the cross and rose again and then he came back and talked to the disciples and he was about to ascend into heaven, he said to them, it's good for you that I go. Because when I go, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit and he will be your helper and he will teach you what to do. And under the new covenant, we aren't just called to a task. We're not called to a thing. We're not called to a a vocation. We're called to a life. And I want to talk about the call to the kingdom life today. We're called to have kingdom marriages as Christians. We're called to have, be kingdom parents. We're called to, be, to have kingdom businesses. Everything we do as Christians, the Holy Spirit should touch. And our life is kingdom. And so I want to talk about the kingdom life today, and I'm going to talk more about it the next time I preach. Today I'm kind of just introducing the topic, and next, next time I preach I'll get more into depth about how do we live the kingdom life. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would speak to our hearts, and you would change our life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew chapter 22, verse 1 to 14. As always, it will be on the screen, so you can follow along. Matthew chapter 22. Jesus told them other parables. He said, The kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a king who prepared a great wedding feast for his son. When the banquet was ready, he sent his servants to notify those who were invited, but they all refused to come. So he sent other servants to tell them, The feast has been prepared. The bulls and the fatted cattle have been killed and everything is ready. Come to the banquet. But the guest he had invited ignored them. And they went their own way. One to his farm. Another to his business. Another seized his messengers and insulted them and killed them. The king was furious. And he set out his army to destroy the murderers and burn their town. And he said to his servants... The wedding feast is ready, and the guests I have invited aren't worthy of the honor. Now go out to the street corners and invite everyone you see. So the servants brought in everyone they could find, good and bad alike, and the banquet was filled with guests. But when the king came in to meet the guests, he noticed a man who wasn't wearing the proper clothes for a wedding. Friend, he said, how is it that you are without wedding clothes? But the man had no reply. The king said to his aides, bind his hands and his feet and throw him into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called and few are chosen. 
It's interesting. We live in a church age where the message of grace is everywhere. And grace is the, the doctrine of the day. This is not a parable that many pastors want to preach on anymore because the grace in this story isn't obvious. We look at that story and, and we can't preach it to, to big crowds because we can't, we can't find the grace. And I don't think it's that there's not grace in this story, but I think it's because grace is misunderstood. We preach grace as a license to sin When in fact, grace is the supernatural ability given by God to do right. So we got to ask, where, where is the grace in this story? Because when I look at this story, I see grace all over the story. Where is the grace in the story? The grace is in the fact that everyone is invited. The grace is found in the fact that everyone is invited and everybody is welcome. It's interesting, when the first invitations were given out, it was given to a selected group. And in the story, I'm not going to dig too deep into this story, but what he's talking about is the people of Israel and the Gentiles and how the Israelites rejected Christ, the Israelites rejected Christ and it was open to the Gentiles. And there's a whole theology behind that. But we see in the beginning of the story, the invitations are given to a selected group, but they turn down the invitation. They didn't want to go. They didn't want, they didn't want to go to the banquet but it seemed like they were a selected group. They, they, they seemed to have a lot to offer. But when the, when the king says to his servants, go, go and find anybody who will come, he actually said that this select group wasn't worthy of the honor. Although they were special, although they, had, they seemingly had something to offer, they weren't ready or deserving of the honor to be at the banquet. And so he says to them, and here's the grace. He says, invite everybody. Invite those who are really good. And he says, invite those who are really bad. He gives them invitations. And, and he says, go up to them. And if they're, if they're the banker who's got a nice suit. And has got everything that looks good and looks right. They deserve an invitation. But he said, if you see a homeless man. And he's on the street. And he's drunk. And, and he can't even stand up. I want you to take that invitation. I want you to give that invitation to him too. This is a banquet that everyone is invited to. It is open. And this is Grace. Grace is, there is no favorites in the kingdom of God. Grace is, everybody is welcome. That's grace. And if we preach grace as just a, simply a license to sin and everything goes, you're not going to find grace in this story. In fact, you won't find that grace anywhere in this book. But if we understand grace is the fact that we're all invited, It's something to be celebrated, and we see it everywhere. Grace is not the license to sin. Grace is God's supernaturally, uh, supernatural ability to do well and to do good. And so everybody's invited. The servants go out, and they give invitations. I don't know what those invitations looked like, but it was a piece of paper or something, something significant so that when they got to the door of the banquet hall, they could say, look, I got my invitation and the doors will be open and you can come on in and you can be in this banquet. And that's grace. Thank God for grace. Because if it was about goodness, if it was about perfection, none of us would have get an invitation. But I got an invitation, you got an invitation, and we're all invited to the banquet. But when I look further onto this story, we go to verse 11. And we find something interesting. 
says, when the king came to meet the guests, he noticed a man who wasn't wearing proper clothes for a wedding. Again, this doesn't seem like grace, because what do they do this man who isn't wearing proper clothes? They actually kick him out of the banquet. So when I look at that, I go, wow, that, God, where is the grace? In this moment, the king comes up to this man, and he, he stands out in the crowd. He, the king's eyes are drawn to this one man who isn't wearing proper clothes. And he doesn't go up to him and say, hey, that's all right. He goes up to him and he says, you know what? You're not welcome at this banquet. And I, I struggle to find grace there. I, I have a hard time coming to terms with that. But what it makes me think is, those clothes are pretty important. There's something about those clothes that has eternal value. Now, Jesus often spoke in parables, so we know he's not talking about a three-piece suit here. We know that these clothes must represent something very important, very significant. And what do the clothes represent? The clothes represent salvation through Jesus Christ and the cleansing through the blood of Christ. It's interesting that, you see, the grace is everybody in, is invited. But there's a, a dress code. Doesn't sound like the right thing to preach in a church like Cheers. I'm, I'm in a shirt, T-shirt and shorts and, and, and flip-flops. But I'm not talking about there's a dress, a dress code to go to church. I'm talking about When the servants went out and they went to the rich man in a three-piece suit, they handed him an invitation. And they said, you know what, that's a nice suit. But when you come to this banquet, these are the clothes that you need to wear. And when they go to the poor, homeless, drunk on the street, they say, here's an invitation. I know you don't feel ready. I know you don't feel clean. I know you don't feel right. But along with this invitation, we want to give you some wedding clothes. And you can put on these clothes. And when you get to the door, if you have on these clothes, you're going to come into this feast and you're going to have a celebration. See, the grace here is that well, he gives you the invitation, but he also makes, it a, makes a way for you to enter the feast. What kind of God would he be if he said, you know what, everybody's invited, but you all have to look a certain way. And the banker would say, well, I can look that way, but the poor man say, would say, I can't afford, this is all I have. Well, too bad, you're out. The, the, the king says, I'm going to give them invitations, and I'm going to give them the clothes they need. I'm going to give them what they need to enter that banquet. I'm going to give them what they need, not only to walk through the door, but to take, partake of the feast, partake of the fellowship, to partake of everything that comes with that feast. All they need to do is put on the clothes. So what am I saying? I'm saying that there is this grace that's being preached in the church today that says everyone's welcome but we're not telling them that there's a dress code. We're telling them that, you know what, if you're good enough, you can come into the feast. We're telling them there's so many different ways, there's so many different gates, there's so many different roads. Just be a good person, just tithe, just show up, just be here, just do that. And we tell them everything they need to hear, everything they want to hear, but we don't tell them what they need to hear. You have to clothe yourself in Christ if you want to attend the banquet. You have to accept Jesus Christ. You've got to bow your knee and you've got to receive the washing through the blood of Jesus Christ. No one gets in because they're good. Nobody gets in because they have it all together. We all get the invitation, but we all got to humble ourselves and clothe ourselves with Christ if we want to eat. We, we, we see, we, grace is, he gives us an invitation and he makes a way. The, he made a way when he sent his, his son to die on the cross, shed his blood for us. He said, when I do this, I'm going to give them the clothes they need to come to the banquet. 
He paid for your outfit. He paid for the outfit that the poor guy needs. He pays for the outfit that the rich guy needs. He paid for it, and he gives it to us. But he says, you can't come into this banquet on your own terms. You see, that's what we're preaching today. You're all invited, and you can come on your own terms. And so the rich guy, the, the guy comes in, and, and he's the only guy who's not dressed properly. And, the, and the, the king comes to him and says, where are your clothes? And he has no answer. For some reason, this guy's given the invitation, he's given the clothes, and he decides, no one's going to tell me what to wear. No one's going to tell me what I need to wear in that banquet. And who knows what he was wearing. But he was wearing what he wanted to wear. He was going to go to that banquet on his own terms. He was going to do what he wanted to do. He was going to be who he wanted to be. He was going to be an individual. He had his rights, and who dare tell him what to do? But Jesus said, if anybody wants to come after me, they're going to have to pick up a cross. And this guy tries to come on his own terms, on his own way, and he says, I'm not wearing those clothes, and, I, and you know what? Too bad if he doesn't like it when I get there. And so he gets to the door, and he's got his invitation. And he hands it to the guy at the gate, and the guy looks him over, and he says, well, you're not really dressed, but I got my invitation. So he walks in, they let him in, and the, the king comes and says, where are your clothes? And all of a sudden, he's not so cocky. All of a sudden, he's not like, you can't tell me what to do. All of a sudden, he's overwhelmed by the presence of the king. And the king says, where's your clothes? And he says, I don't have an answer. All those arrogant, all those cocky, all those who are going to do their own thing and do it their own way. And, they, and they're going to they're be proud and arrogant in this life. But one day, the Bible says, we're going to stand before him and every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth to the glory of God the Father. And we don't want to do it in North America. We want to show up in our own clothes. We want, we want grace as a license to sin. It doesn't exist in this book. It doesn't exist. I'm getting so Pentecostal, I'm spitting all over the place. Because I'm sick and tired of us telling God how it's going to be. God bless my life. I'm talking about a kingdom life here. And there's more to the kingdom life than just having a ticket to the banquet. I'm talking about what it, what it takes to, to live a kingdom life. And I want to tell you that what it takes is surrender. It doesn't take name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. It takes a man or a woman who says, Lord, I will bow my knee. And I will live by the precepts of your word. The clothes. The clothes. It's Jesus. It's his blood. It's not your gifting. It's not your talents. It's not your ability. It doesn't matter if you can stand on a stage and preach to thousands of people. He said on that day, many will come and say, Lord, Lord. And he said, I never knew you. Get away from me. But I cast out demons. I preached. I did that. I never knew you. You never clothed yourself in me. Oh, you looked impressive. You had the three-piece suit, and you had all the words, and you talked all the lingo, but we never knew each other. Can't preach this sermon in church anymore. Because we want crowds. You don't think I want a crowd? I want a crowd. You think I'm happy that there's not very many people here today? I'm not happy. But I want to, on the day I stand before Christ, say, Lord, I told the truth. I want to have peace in my heart that I preach the message. There's a story we, in the book of Acts. And, uh, you know, Peter and John, they went to pray. And they met a lame man on the way. He stuck out his palm and asked for an alm. And this is what they had to say. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ, rise and walk. What a powerful story. 
It's not just a song from Sunday school. It's actually in the book. And in Acts chapter 4, we see what happens after that story. This is an incredible time in the books of Acts. This is revival. This is people are getting saved by the thousands. This is Peter and John are doing miracles. It's what we dream for. It's what we hope for. It's what, what we'd all love to see in Penticton is happening. And so they heal a man and people are getting saved. And they, now that they've healed this person, they have the attention of all these people. So they start to preach. And this is what they say. Well, Peter and John were, were speaking to the people. They were confronted by the priests, the captain of the temple guard, and some of the succadees. These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus there is a resurrection of the dead. They arrested them, and since it was already evening, they put them in jail until morning. But many of the people who heard their message believed it, so the number of men who believed now totaled 5,000 people. So here's Peter and John. They have received their invitation. They have clothed themselves in Christ. And, you know, and part, part of our North American theology is, well, then that's it. Now we just sit around and we wait to die and then we go to the feast. But they, they knew that they weren't just, you know, the call to the kingdom life is not just a call to heaven. The call to the kingdom life is there's something on earth that we need to do. And they're living the kingdom life and, and they're healing this crippled man and thousands of people are getting saved and it's great revival. They're living that life and you know what happens? They get thrown in jail. Well, I thought if, Lord, if you were blessing my life, it would all, it would all work out. Lord, if I go and heal people on the streets and, and people are getting saved, this is going to be great. And I'm going to have a television ministry. <laughs> and people are going to sing my praises. Maybe I can write a book and I can live off the royalties. And, and we have this whole mindset of what it could look like. But for them, they ended up in jail. So what, is, what do we learn from Scripture here? That opposition doesn't mean God's mad at you. Option me, opposition may mean that the devil's mad at you and that you're doing something right. They were doing something right and they stirred up the devil and now they're in prison and they can't go to court until the morning so they're in prison all night alone with their thoughts. What are they thinking? I healed somebody and this is what I get. Are they so full of self-pity, self-doubt? Well, we see what happens in the morning. Let's see what they did all night. Doesn't look like they sat there feeling sorry for themselves. Because the next morning, the two disciples, they brought the two disciples and demanded, by what power or in whose name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit. That's the kingdom life right there. filled with the Holy Spirit in the right way at the right time just when you need it. Opposition comes your way. You don't have to cower. You don't have to bow down. You don't have to feel sorry for yourself. If you would just delight yourself in the Lord, if you would just open your heart to him at the right time, in the right moment, Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. I want you to know that, that you can't do what God's called you to do unless you're filled with the Holy Spirit. And you can't be filled with the Holy Spirit if you're in prison feeling sorry for yourself. We need to get our eyes off of the prison bars and we need to put our eyes up to heaven and we need to call out to God, Lord, I may be going through hell, but you're in this furnace with me and I'm not coming out of this thing singed or burned. I'm coming out of this thing on fire for you, filled with the Holy Spirit, so I can do what you've called me to do. And Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit. And they began to question him. He says, rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? And here it is right here. Let me clearly state to all of you and all the people of Israel that he was healed by, a powerful name, by the powerful name of Christ Jesus, 
the Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says, the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. There is no salvation in anyone else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. I, I'm just a guy in Penticton. I don't know what it's like to have all kinds of influence where the whole world looks at you. I don't know what it's like to have a big TV ministry and everybody wants to know what you have to say or what you think is right. But I know this, that there are no two greater leaders in the church than Peter and John. Like these guys have credentials. And they find themselves in a situation where what they're about to say is the truth. But the culture that they're speaking to is not going to like that truth. The truth that Peter speaks in that moment is not culturally acceptable or popular. And I, I, I'm just dying to see one of these big name influential preachers go on Oprah, go on Larry King, and when they're asked the, the, the direct questions, give a direct answer. Like Peter and John, they don't skirt, they don't skirt around the issue. They don't, they don't try to dance around it. They don't try to, to, to say something in a politically correct way that somehow won't, won't, won't affect their ministry, won't affect their revenue. Won't aff- they, they aren't about that. They're about the kingdom. And, they, and Peter says, you know what? Let me clearly tell you the truth. You've asked a question. Let me give you an answer. There is no salvation in anyone else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. See, Peter knows it's not enough to give, to give go out and give the invitation. He says, we got to give him the wedding clothes. We can preach grace, we can preach grace, we can preach grace. And we can give everybody an invitation. But if we don't give them the wedding clothes, they're going to stand before the king at that feast and they're not going to be prepared. And Peter says, I'm going to preach the truth in love because I want these people, even these religious people who are questioning me, who are, who are accusing me, who are trying to, to derail me, i got to preach the truth to them because if they accept the invitation, I want them to be prepared. I want them to be clothed in Christ. You see, church, that's grace. Grace isn't telling everybody everything goes. Grace is preaching the truth in love so that one day when they do get to the banquet, they will be prepared. I'm talking about the kingdom life. Jesus ends that parable by saying, many are called, but few are chosen. Many are going to come with their invitation to the gate. but few will be prepared. Oh, we like the idea of heaven and we like the idea of salvation and we like the Father heart of God. But few will truly surrender. Few will truly read this book and allow it to change their life. Allow it to change their thinking. Allow it to change them. We are called to more than just the promise of heaven. We're called to live a kingdom life on earth. One day the disciples came to Jesus and they said, Father, teach us how to pray. And he said this, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, 
May your name be kept holy. May your kingdom come soon. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Just as the king wouldn't give out an invitation without the wedding clothes. You know, what, kind of, what kind of sadistic person or king would do that? Invite you to a wedding and then demand that you dress up and knowingly, knowing that you can't. Jesus tells his disciples to pray this because he says this is possible. He wouldn't tell his disciples, pray that the kingdom of heaven would, would come on earth. If that wasn't a possible prayer, that could be answered. Why, why would Jesus tell us to pray that if that, if that wasn't possible? He's called us to a kingdom life. And he makes it possible. And I'll finish with this verse. 2 Peter 1.3. For as you know him better, he will give you, through his great power, everything you need for living a truly good life. He even shares his own glory and his goodness with us. This is not heaven's waiting room. We're on the earth to live a truly good life. We're not here wait, suffering through, waiting to someday go to the banquet. We're called to a kingdom life, and we have everything we need to get there. And I'm going to talk about that in my next sermon. I'm going to end with this scripture. This today was just an introduction, because the first step is accepting the invitation. Accepting that you're, you're welcome, you're invited. Second step is bending your knee and accepting him to your heart. Receiving forgiveness, receiving cleansing, and being prepared. But after that, that's when the real fun happens. You know what, I just want to, before I close off, I just want to, in this moment, just take a moment to evaluate our hearts and our minds before Christ. It's been a challenging message. Maybe in this moment there are things that you just need to surrender. Maybe in this moment when I talked about the one who wanted to come on their own terms. Maybe that hit home with you this morning. Here's the grace. We can simply repent. We can simply retent, repent and, and get back on track. And reprioritize things in our lives. Father, I thank you for the grace in your word. Lord, not a, I, I'm not talking about a license to sin. I'm talking about what Peter just said. The supernatural ability to do good. To live a godly life. To make a difference for you. Lord, we don't want just be called to, to just be called to a task. Lord, we want to be called to living a kingdom life. Lord, we want kingdom marriages. Lord, we want to be kingdom parents. Lord, we want to be kingdom business owners. We want to be kingdom-minded people. Lord, just like Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit right at the exact moment. Lord, that we're hearing from you and that we're living for you. In Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. The Lord be gracious to you and give you peace. Be blessed as you go. Have a great week.